oh my gosh, the clock is ticking down already. I was like, ah! Um, okay, so this might be one of the most unorthodox presentations you have ever seen, and here's why. Uh, for one, I am a storyteller with pictures, not a whole lot with words, so bear with me. I'm going to have a multimedia piece that plays behind me. It kind of helps explain the story in ways that my words cannot. So hopefully that'll take you on a little journey. Um, and two, and probably the most important reason is, I have a traumatic brain injury, so my thoughts tend to get thought on little butterflies and things like that. So it just kind of helps keep me on track. I hope you're a forgiving crowd, because even if it doesn't keep me on track, my tangential thoughts maybe take you on a journey too. Well, we'll see. Do we have any veterans in the room, M military veterans? Can you please stand up for me, please? Please, I want to thank you for your service. And, and just be warned, um, and I know how this works, if you've been in combat, um, there is some combat imagery, so be prepared. Okay, so let's get started. Those guys in the back are doing a wonderful job. Okay, so like family tradition, I joined the military at 17, I enlisted, and they trained me to be a photographer. They actually gave this person a top secret clearance. Woo! Um, but what I really wanted to do was be a combat photographer, so I applied to the Elite Combat Camera Unit, and lo and behold, I was accepted. I flew hundreds and hundreds of hours in various military aircraft and then trained for ground combat. What's more is I had the wonderful opportunity to travel all over the world. 280 days a year I traveled to Morocco, Kenya, Uganda, all over Asia, all over Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe. Needless to say, it was a glamorous lifestyle. But, um, you know, in all of that, there was also my tours in combat, including Iraq. Get over. You gotta put somebody on the ground. Did you see? I'm gonna see you right here. Get in the car. Let's go, let's go. training that I had leading up to actually going to war, it couldn't have prepared me for what reality is. It's the ups, downs, life, death. And every morning that I woke up as a combat photographer in Iraq, I had to accept death as a part of a, po a possibility. The sooner that I could accept death as um, an a possibility, the, the sooner I could actually focus on my job, and that is to document America's unsung heroes doing the most wicked job that one could ever imagine in the most unique cir circumstances you can even think of. And in my mind, I carry the most powerful weapon possible, the camera, that I could educate and bring to life these, these human beings in the most um, unique circumstances and educate people about what combat was like. But in the meantime, I felt everything they felt. I had the ups, the downs, the emotions, because I was there, I was in uniform, I was living it, and I was fighting this war too. been a very powerful tool for me, but it wasn't a shield, and I got wounded twice, once in 2004 and again in 2007. Ultimately, that last injury is what ended my career, and oh my gosh, this was all I had ever known for 10 years. What does a combat photographer do when they don't have combat anymore? Well, that was a good question, and I lingered on that question for a long time. And Eventually, I was retired from service at the age of 27, the youngest in South Carolina, I might add. 
No, I'm just kidding. I'm pretty sure there's probably some younger person out there. But I digress. Anyway, so I transferred my medical health care from active duty service into the VA. What I hadn't really occurred to me, and yes, I, I realized I'm a woman, and I knew I was a woman in combat, which was very unique. What I didn't realize was that I was going to go from fighting the war on the front lines to fighting a war with the very people that were there supposedly to support me. In effect, what I found was this, um, this lack of care for women veterans specifically. And for veterans at large, there was a lot of issues. So here's this young blood coming into the VA, and I'm sitting there in the waiting room, and this is perfect. Because one of the veterans leans over and he's like, are you uh, taking your grandpa to his appointment? <laughs> well, now that you mention it, actually, I'm a veteran. And what I realized was there's, there was this hole in our society about what we perceive veterans to be. White, middle-aged, maybe Vietnam era. But that's just not true. We have every, every demographic, every walk of life, every race, creed, color, religion, because we are society, a slice of it, put in uniform. We've all served very proudly. And so I began the Veterans Portrait Project. And what it did was it got the camera back in my hands, gave me a purpose, and I wasn't thinking about myself more than I was thinking about my veteran community and how I could help them raise awareness, educate people who veterans are, what they need, what their aspirations are. And the minute I could serve some, something bigger than myself, I found that I had a purpose again. And that was my future. Look at that face. I mean, how can you not deny that? It's so wonderful. But I, I want to be part of America's next greatest generation. And I want to bring people on board with me. Even if you haven't served, I want, you to bring, I want to bring you into this community. We're small, but we're fierce, right? Well, this exhibition is all over, and I'm still traveling all over the US doing the Veterans Portrait Project, gathering information and telling their stories, because these are the unsung heroes. Each and every person has a story to tell, and I want to share that with the world. Through the Veterans Portrait Project, I'm able to do that. But here's the thing. I've been funding this all by myself, as many entrepreneurs do when they first start out. And so I would work really, really hard, set aside, squirrel aside some money. Travel to um, a VA in Georgia, a VA in Nevada, and take portraits of veterans. And I was like, well, I don't know if I can sustain this too long doing it on my own. Uh, and then other people started getting on board, and wow, was I surprised how much people wanted to help. Not just veterans themselves, but other people who saw the value in this educational process, in this relationship. Isn't he sweet? So cute. Well, how was I going to make money? I had a skill that I hadn't realized. What does a combat photographer do outside of combat? Well, it seems pretty short-sighted, really, without combat. That doesn't make much sense. But what I hadn't realized, and somebody else actually realized the potential within me, was that I had a unique asset. I had combat experience. I was eh, some creative talent in photography. And they said, can we marry the two? I was like, bing, here we go. OK, so um, there's photographers out there, and they're commercial photographers. They do really good about creating ad campaigns surrounding various um, retail stuff. Body armor, armored cars, all these other things that military folks or law enforcement or fire department people need. It was right there at my fingertips. So I began shooting this, making a little money. I employed veterans as my models. And who couldn't know better what to do in these situations than the real world people? Hello, makes sense. And I was helping out my community. And they, in turn, were helping me. And we could communicate with each other. We spoke the same language. Veterans in the house, everybody. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We have our own little Morse code, if you know. All the acronyms, so, you know. BCGs, you guys know that one, right? Birth control glasses, but we'll talk about that later. So I was taking this, this, the money that I could um, squirrel aside and putting that towards various projects. And in the meantime, because I was carrying around this burden in combat, I couldn't, I didn't have time to grieve the loss of my friends. I was busy photographing and, and you know, showing what they were doing. And so I took the time to go back to Arlington, say farewell to my friends in the most proper way. And, and I also began to mark my stories and put these uh, experiences down on paper, which Shooter came about. And what I didn't realize was that 
Other people were going to use this book as part of their therapy program. And then it occurred to me, what about photojournalists operating in high-risk environments? I know I didn't have any manual out there that said, here's step one in combat about how to survive. So I put that into words, got it out on paper, did my second book, and I was like purging all of these things that were inside of me. Um, whew, take a deep breath. So, whoo, got all of these things out, and um, I was starting to get uh, really motivated about helping bring about change within, within my own veterans community. I stopped asking myself, what can I do? And started to asking myself, what can we do collectively? Because I tell you what, just like in the military, we call ourselves military units. It's not a military one, it's a military unit. What can we do together to accomplish? And so I started working with various service, uh, veteran service organizations and nonprofit organizations to help purchase, house, purchase houses for wheelchair-bound veterans. State-of-the-art prosthesis, hey, where are you at? Right there, you're the future, man. And um, you know, getting PTSD programs off the ground that are more than just talk therapy. <sighs> so, how was I gonna get the word out? How could I unite these fronts? Well, um, I talked on radio stations, wrote a couple books, did a couple documentaries, went out to conventions and talked to military leadership, went to universities, talked to tomorrow's leaders, okay? I talked to the president and his first lady, went to the Pentagon and went to talk to some of those leaders, and I said, hey, here are some of the issues. Can you help me be part of that solution? We wrote some songs about it, tried another platform, did a documentary. Whew, where do I have time? But my hair is falling out, okay? Ultimately, everyone started to rally, and that New York Times article is why I'm here today. Thank you, Saul and the Biff team, for having me here, by the way. And Oprah Winfrey. I know I heard Oprah's name dropped a couple times earlier. Hey, Oprah, yes, be there. Uh, so what I did is I showed up and I shared the story. But what I wanted to accomplish was to make sure that no other veteran experienced the negative negative experience that I had during my recovery, because it certainly delayed my recovery time. What really should have taken six months took two years, and I didn't want to see anybody else do that. But in large part, a lot of it was the loss of my job. I had been a combat photographer for 10 years. And what does a combat photographer do without combat? Well, after I was retired from service, not only was I recovering, but I bought a business called the Charleston Center for Photography. This gave me a motivation and a platform to be able to share the craft and art of photography, to give people a platform to be creative, to share their lives, to share their experiences in a unique way. Youth programs, retiree programs, and here's one that's most near and dear to my heart, disabled veterans. I had a disabled veteran with me last year when I, when I taught at the Lieutenant Dan Weekend Retreat. She was completely blind gave her a camera, gave her some tools, taught her the art. She's been shooting this last entire year. She has pictures that blow me away, inspire me. So giving people the tools they need to feel better about themselves and push themselves down the road, what can we do collectively to help others? Well, the Charleston Center for Photography helps build the craft of photography and um, gives me the ability to share my art but also the freedom to help the veterans in the way I want to. Now, you don't have to go and invest gobs of money. You could go down to the VA and sit with a World War II veteran who's in a retirement home, has no more living relatives. You could go down to the American Legion and maybe take a clothes drive or things like that, bring them over to your local uh, VA community. These are things that we can do that don't require monetary investment, but something from the heart. When it's genuine, it's real and it's fulfilling, and that's what drives me. That's what makes me move forward. Both my photography and, and myself as a veteran, they're inextricably, inextricably linked. And I will always drive forward whatever I'm doing, whether it's philanthropic or professionally, will be based on those two endeavors. Thank you very much.